I'd like to welcome you to our adult Bible study for Wednesday, June the 3rd, coming to you from my home office. Are you ready to go to the Word of God today? We are continuing our series entitled, How You Can Be Ready for the End Times. Do you have your Bible? Please go ahead and take your Bible. Would you turn with me to the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Okay, take a minute. I want you to follow along. I want you to look at the Word of God. Can you turn to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, and I'm going to invite you to follow along with me. I'll give you a minute to find the scriptures. We are continuing our road trip. Did you come with me last week? Last Wednesday, we started our road trip through the end times. I hope you like road trips because we are continuing our road trip through the end times and we're making 12 stops on the way. Would you come and join me for our road trip? Uh, again today, we're making 12 stops. What are the 12 stops? Number one, the coming of the Lord for his church. Today, we're going to stop by the tribulation. And, num and this third stop is the rise of the Antichrist. We're going to look at these two today. And then in the coming weeks, we're going to look at the battle of Gog and Magog, the abomination of desolation, the battle of Armageddon, the judgment of nations, the binding of Satan, the thousand-year reign of Christ, the last battle, and the great white throne judgment, and finally, our last stop on our road trip through the end times will be the new heavens and the new earth. Last week, we traveled to our first stop, the coming of the Lord for his church. That was what we talked about. Please check it out last week if you haven't had a chance to. And so we are continuing our journey, our road trip through the end times. And today we are going to our next destination on our road trip. We're going to go to the seven-year tribulation. Go ahead and write that down. This is stop number two, the seven-year tribulation. And stop number three, the rise of the Antichrist. Are you ready to go? Uh, do you have everything you need for your road trip today? What do you have? Of course, you have your Bible. That is essential for your road trip through the end times. But we're on a road trip. So what else do we need for our road trip? I'm bringing raisins. I hope you brought some food. I, I'm bringing Nutella because you always need something sweet on a road trip. But I'm also bringing one more thing just to get you thinking. I'm also bringing a lantern. Now, why would I bring a lantern for this trip? We have already talked about the coming of the Lord for his church. But now we are going on in our road trip to our second and third stop, and we're going to talk about the tribulation. We're going to talk about the rise of the Antichrist. Listen, church, why am I bringing a lantern for this road trip? Listen, it's going to get dark out there. We are going to enter some dark days. Now, listen, you and I, we won't be part of this. We are being caught up together with the Lord before the tribulation, before the dark days. But for this study, we are going to explore on our road trip these dark days, the tribulation, the rise of the Antichrist. And so because the in our study, in our stop, in our road trip, we're going to experience some dark days. I'm going to bring a lantern so that we can see clearly, and we can keep moving forward through our study. So this is our lantern, and uh, we're going to talk about these difficult things, talk about these days of rebellion, fear, and chaos, the tribulation about is it entering a time of judgment and desolation, uh, a time of trouble for the whole world. The Bible calls the time of tribulation Jacob's Trouble. And so we're going to talk about this today. Will you come with me? I'm not going to be long. I'm going to move quickly. I'm, uh, I'm giving you an overview. And of course, before we start our road trip, 
we have to stop and pray for traveling mercies. Come on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I join with the people of God today and we look to the Word of God, we open the Word of God, we read and declare the Word of God, but Lord, help us to also apply it. So increase our understanding, increase our knowledge, illuminate our hearts by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I approach this topic with humility in my heart. Lord, I pray that I would not be dogmatic or push an opinion, but that, Lord, we would look at the plain reading of Scripture and understand it with our eyes open, our ears open, our understanding ready to receive so that we can be aware, alert, and awake to the signs of the times. I pray for your help today, and Lord, I pray your blessing on the people of God as we journey together to our next stop. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready for the Word of God? We are starting our journey on our way to the second stop, the tribulation. I'm reading from the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Are you there? Are you ready? I'm reading. Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, he says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. So what's Paul talking about? He's talking about the rapture, when the church is gathered together to the Lord. Concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, verse 2, do not become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord, the rapture, has already come. Now, wait, do you see what's going on here? The people were thinking maybe the rapture has already come. Paul says, don't be alarmed. Verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, what's that day? The rapture. That day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, who's that? The Antichrist, is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. Who is this Antichrist? Verse 4, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he, here now, sets himself up. Did you hear that? He sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Okay, wait for a moment. Remember in Matthew 24, Jesus called this the abomination that what? Causes desolation. Or it's a, an abomination is what? A false image that will be in the temple in Jerusalem. And what will this false image do? It will cause desolation. Or what? It will unleash the wrath of God. This is what Paul is teaching the church. So verse 5, he says, verse 5, Don't you remember? Come on, church. He says, don't you remember? that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. Verse 6, And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. Okay, wait, verse 6, we're talking about the Antichrist. And now you know what is holding him back. What is holding the Antichrist back, church? What is holding him back? The Holy Spirit. So that he may be revealed at the proper time. Okay, we, church, listen to me, we're approaching the proper time. This is the end times. Verse 7, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back, the Holy Spirit, will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Okay, I want you to hear this today. Not away, but out of the way. Okay, and so the Holy Spirit is at work in, in, uh, in the people of God, but there will be coming a time when the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way. Do you see this? Out of the way, not away, 
but out of the way so that the uh, Antichrist can be revealed. Okay, so verse 8, and then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Wait, do you see how, how powerful our Lord Jesus Christ is? That this Antichrist is so great, but this Antichrist will be defeated with what? The, the breath of his mouth. The breath of, of, of Jesus. That's how powerful. Come on, somebody, go ahead, church. Just praise the Lord. You serve a powerful God that by the breath of his mouth, the Antichrist will be destroyed. Okay, I got to keep going. Verse 9, are you still with, with me? Are you still in the word of God? Verse 9, what is Paul doing? He's teaching the church. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one or the Antichrist will be in accordance with how Satan works. He Satan will use all sorts of displays or power through signs and wonders that serve the lie, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Verse 11, verse 11 and 12. For this reason, God sends them, uh, this is the, the people that are alive in the tribulation. God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, the lie of the Antichrist, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted, come on, hear this now, delighted in wickedness. Church, I want you to spend time in this word today and meditate upon the word of God as we follow the journey through the end times. We're talking about the tribulation and the revealing of the Antichrist. And this scripture is so filled, it brims over with uh, exhortation and information. I, I can't touch on all of it today, but let the word of God dwell in your hearts richly today. Are you still with me? Do you have your lantern? Okay, I have my lantern. We are entering dark a dark season when we talk about the tribulation, okay? So, let me talk about this passage for a moment. Paul is teaching the Christians in Thessalonica. Where is that? This is in modern-day Greece, Paul is teaching. Paul is actually countering false teaching that was going on in the churches. So, listen, people were coming to the church in the... Th uh, Thessalonica. People were coming to the church and they were saying, what were they saying? They were false teaching. Uh, they were coming in. Preachers and prophets were coming into the church. And what were they doing? They were telling the people of God that the Lord had already returned for his church. The rapture had already happened. I don't know what they said, but maybe they said, too bad, church. You missed the rapture. Jesus has already come for the church. Well, the, the church, how would you feel if, can you imagine just for a moment that somebody came into Richmond Hill Pentecostal Church and stood up on the platform and said to the people of God, Jesus has already come. You missed it. Well, you know better than that. But this is what Paul is teaching the church and Paul is telling the church, listen, you're, you're, you're unsettled and upset. You're alarmed. People have told you that the rapture has already happened. And why were the people of God so upset and so alarmed? Because now they, they feel like they have to go through the tribulation. Now they're going to have to suffer. They missed the rapture. Jesus has already come. They're too late. And now... They have to go through the tribulation. Now they have to suffer. Now they have to endure the wrath of God upon the earth. Now they have to endure through the tribulation and wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the thought of going through the tribulation, what a frightening prospect. 
I'm so glad you and I do not have to go through the tribulation. We belong to the bride of Christ, and Jesus the bridegroom is coming for his bride. Can you praise the Lord today? Go ahead. Just praise the Lord. Church, you are not... Uh, the tribulation is not meant for the church. You are the bride of Christ. Jesus, the bridegroom, is coming to receive his bride. I want you to praise him. Can you take a 30-second praise today? Come on, let's give the Lord praise. What a great God. What a great salvation. What a great deliverance. Church, we serve an awesome God. He's coming for his bride. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Praise the name of the Lord. And Paul says to the believers in Thessalonica, don't be deceived. Jesus has not yet come for his church. The rapture of the church, the catching away, the gathering of the church has not yet occurred. Be at peace. You have not missed the rapture. Do you know when I grew up in the church, there was a lot of pastors and preachers coming into the church when I was a child and they would be preaching on being ready at any moment. Boy, this as, as a child hearing this, I, I, I was nervous that maybe I'd miss the coming of the Lord. And these pastors would preach with passion. They would prepare the people of God to walk holy lives, to, to serve the Lord, and to be ready for his coming at any moment. Good word for the people of God. But I remember as a child, I was always wondering if I might miss the rapture. I never forget this moment because I don't know what grade I was in or how old I was, but I remember I came home from school one day and no one was around. The whole house was empty. I yelled out, but nobody answered. There was a pot of boiling water sitting on the stove. There was a plate of food sitting on the table. And it suddenly struck me that the rapture has taken place. And I was left behind. And then my mother came up from the basement and said, what is all this commotion about? Why are you so upset? Well, when I think back to that humorous story, I think about this church in Thessalonica, in the book of Second Thessalonians. The church is really experiencing the same thing, the same fear. False teachers had had told them the rapture has already happened and you've been left behind. Now you have to go through the tribulation. Now you have to experience the wrath of God. But what does Paul say? Come on, church, are you still with me? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Here's what Paul says to the church. Receive this today. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, the rapture will not come until the rebellion or the tribulation occurs and the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. What's Paul saying? Don't worry, church. Walk with God. You'll know. You will know. You keep walking with God. And when Jesus comes for his church, you'll be received Together with the saints, the dead in Christ will rise and we will meet the Lord in the air. Don't worry, you won't miss it. You'll be, you'll walk, as you walk with God, Jesus will come for you. Hallelujah. And so this is what Paul is saying to the church. He is really telling the church that if you believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you will not suffer in the tribulation. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, are you with me? We're getting close to our first destination. Do you still have the 
uh, lantern. I have my lantern. I want to make sure we're walking with vision, with clarity, with understanding. And I want to give you the timeline. Can I give you a timeline? This will help some of you, especially if you're brand new to this study. I'm going to give you four things right now. Are you ready for the timeline? So what, what is the next thing to happen in our lives? What's the next thing to happen in, in our lives, whether we are alive or we have passed away because the dead in Christ will rise? What's the next thing to happen for the people of God? What's the next thing? Number one, the rapture, when Jesus comes for his church. What's the second thing? Then begins the seven-year tribulation. Okay? Now, what's the third thing? I'm giving you three and I'm giving you four. Next is, ha listen now, halfway through the seven-year tribula tribulation, the Antichrist is revealed. And number four, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, Jesus returns to earth with the saints of God, with the church, which is with his bride. Okay, four, four timeline points for you today. So, these are the, we're talking about the signs of the times. Uh, it's about to get dark. Let's, let's go to our second stop. What's the second stop? The seven-year tribulation. So let's talk about the seven-year tribulation. Are you ready? Seven-year tribulation. I'm looking at the scriptures again from what we just read. Here it is, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. We already read it. I'm reading it again. It Paul says, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And the lawless one will be revealed. Church, let's talk about this, this dark time, the seven-year tribulation. This is a dark time for the whole world. The church has been raptured. Born-again believers are absent from the earth. The world is lurching, come on, to a new world order and a one world government. I want you to remember those two things a new world order, and a one world government. Church, there's a new world order. We are marching toward a new world order. We are marching toward a one world government. Do you hear me today? And it's during this time that the in the tribulation that the Antichrist and his false prophet is about to be revealed. Okay, I, I need to keep going. Are you still with me? Are you still journeying with me? I'm going to give you four questions. Four questions. And I'm going to answer them slowly and carefully. I don't want you to miss it. I'm trying to uh, give you an overview and not get too complicated in, the, in the, the depth of the study. But here's the first question. What is the seven-year tribulation? What, it, what is it? I'm going to give you one sentence. It's a future period. It's still to come of seven years in which God's judgment is poured out on sinful, rebellious, wicked humanity. It's a dark time. Okay, second question. Are you still with me? Second question. Where can we read about the tribulation in the Bible? Where can we read about it? I'm going to give you four, four answers here, four places in the scriptures that we can read about it, and I invite you to study the Word of God to learn more about this. First one is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The next one is where we've been over the last three weeks, Matthew chapter 24. The two other places are very critical and very essential to understanding the end times, and that is Daniel chapter 9, which this is the prophet Daniel's vision of the four world empires. Okay, it's a vision, and so it, you have to read it with care and understanding. Uh, and then also in Revelation chapters 6 to 18, Revelation 6 to 18, this is John's vision of the apocalypse, and of course it's, it's written in apocalyptic visionary language, so it may seem a little daunting and challenging to understand, but uh, it's important that we understand 
these realities and we take them apart and unpack them as best we can. Okay, so these are the four texts that you can go to. Number three, are you still with me? Number three, here's the question number three. How does the Bible describe the tribulation? What does the Bible, what, what words does the Bible use to describe the tribulation? Well, I'm going to give you again four answers. Number one, the day of the Lord. The tribulation is called the day of the Lord. Okay, uh, it's also called, number two, it's called the time of trouble. Time of trouble. Number three, it's called the Great Tribulation, which refers to the second half of the seven years. The, so the first three and a half years, the Tribulation. The second three and a half years, the Great Tribulation. And then the last one is uh, the Tribulation is also called in the Scriptures, it's also called the Time of Jacob's Trouble. You could also say this, the Time of Israel's Trouble. It's, it's where God will come and complete his discipline of Israel for their rejection of the Messiah. Okay? And so, these are my questions. Are you still with me? So, I, what did I do? I just answered three questions. What is the seven-year tribulation? Where can we read about it? And number three, how does the Bible describe the tribulation? Okay? And I gave you four answers, the day of the Lord, the time of trouble, the great tribulation, and the time of Jacob's trouble. Are you, are you following me? Are you still with me? Okay, number four. This is my fourth question, my fourth question. What will happen during the tribulation? What will happen during the the tribulation. This is an important question for us to understand. And church, I believe that you won't be around for it. And I believe I won't be around for it. So can you just be at peace in Jesus' name? But we have been given the instructions in the Word of God so that we can have an awareness of the truth. And I believe that this is written especially for people who come to Jesus during the tribulation, and there will be a revival of faith, okay, during this dark time. So certainly this is written for the saints who, who accept Jesus during the tribulation. So what happens during the tribulation? Two things. What happens during the tribulation? Two things. Number one, God will complete his discipline of Israel for rejecting the Messiah. And number two, God will judge the unbelieving world for their wickedness. Church, let me just say this. Things will be far worse than they are today. You might look around and see trouble on all sides. But I'm here to tell you the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation, will be far worse than you can imagine. Do you have your lantern? I'm telling you. We need to know what the Word of God says about this dark time in the future. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. I read it already. I'm reading it again, but I'm only reading three words. Okay? 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. It says, the power of lawlessness. Church, hear me today. During During the tribulation, there will be unrestrained evil in the world. It will get worse as time goes on. The Antichrist will be revealed. Now listen, I, I can't get too detailed, but listen to me. And let me I'm going to give you a summary. I'm giving you a summary at our, at our second stop, the, the tribulation. Listen, here's what's going to happen during the tribulation. Are you ready? God's anger will burn against the wicked. There will be a time of deception a time of dissension, a time of devastation, a time of disease, a time of disasters, a time of death. As Jesus said, listen to me, Matthew 24, verses 40 and 41, it says, Jesus says, then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. What's Jesus talking about? No, he's not talking about the rapture. He's talking about the tribulation. 
there will this will be a time of death. Revelation chapter 14, 20 says this. It's very difficult to read, but it's the word of God. It says during the tribulation, the blood will flow as high as a horse's bridle. There will be a time of disloyalty, a time of delusion, a time of defection, but there will also come a time of declaration as preachers will go throughout the world declaring the gospel and some people will turn to God. Well, do you still have your lantern? I got to turn it on. Do you still have your lantern? This is a dark time. But this brings us now to our third stop. Okay, I'm moving right along. We went to our second stop, the tribulation. This brings us to our third stop. Here's what our third stop is, the rise of the Antichrist. I'm reading again the scriptures, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 to 12. Okay, listen to the word of God concerning the rise of the Antichrist. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve a lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Verse 11, I'm repeating it for your benefit. It says, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. This is the coming of the Antichrist. So, what's the Antichrist known as? What's another name for the Antichrist? The, Rev, Rev, the book of Revelation calls him the, the what? The beast. The beast. And there'll be coming a time when no one on earth can buy or sell without the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? It's the number 666. And so this is the man of lawlessness. The Antichrist, listen to me, will be satanically empowered, empowered by Satan. And this man will usher in a new world order. Do you hear me, Christian? This Antichrist man will gain worldwide control with promises of peace. Then he will deceive the world and set up an image of himself in the temple. What's that called? Come on, you know what we've been talking about. it. That is called, what's it called? The abomination that causes desolation which will unleash the wrath of God. This Antichrist will be aided by another man. Who's the other man? What's his name? He is called the, what? False prophet, who heads up a religious system that requires, hear this, requires worship of the Antichrist. So, you tell me. It, during the tribulation, there will actually be three characters operating during the tribulation. Who are they? Can you tell me? Can you tell me the three characters operating in harmony, in step, in unity during the tribulation? Who are they? Can you tell me the three? Do you know who they are? Biblical scholars call them the, here's the, the phrase that you might, that will help you remember. They call them, these three, they call them the unholy trinity. Who are they? Okay, what's the first one? the Antichrist. Second one, the false prophet. And the third one, Satan himself. Okay? Last week, you can look it online, last week we talked about the, the ten characteristics of the Antichrist, so we will not go back there today. But here's my question for you. Are you still with me? Here's my question for you. Do you think the Antichrist might already be born? Ooh, what a question. It's 2020. Do you think that the Antichrist might already be in the world today? Church, listen to me. We don't know. 
I don't know. You don't know. We don't know. I may live my whole life and take my last breath, and the Lord's coming is still to come. But we don't know. Listen to me. Are the pieces being put in place today for the emergence of the Antichrist? Yes. There's no question in my mind that we are marching toward a one world government and a new world order. So here's my question. How close are we? First of all, how close are we to the coming of the Lord? But we're staying with the how close are we to the tribulation? These are all things that are still to come. Are you still with me? Listen to me. This coronavirus has people talking. Signs of the times. A signal of the end. An indication of the coming of the Lord. Church, we don't know. But we keep our eye on the signs. Can I tell you a couple things? There's a story that caught my attention. Are you still with me? There's a story that caught my attention. Uh, I was reading the website Politico. You may have heard it. It is a, a, a website that talks about politics and, the, and the, the day that we live in. And there was a former member of the State Department of the United States who wrote this article. Now, I'm just going to tell you the title of the article. Okay, are you ready for the title of the article? It caught me by surprise. Here's the title of the article. The, the world order is dead. Here's how to build a new world order for the post-coronavirus era. World leaders have a chance to craft a new international system that works for this new day. Listen to me. This is not a Christian site. This is a secular site. This is a, a political website. And this article caught my attention. What's this article calling for? It's calling for a post-coronavirus new world order. As I read the article, I was noting some of the unique language in this article. Uh, they were calling the coronavirus pandemic under a new name. Are you ready for the new name? Here it is in quotations. World Crisis One. Almost like World War I, but this is World Crisis I. And they were using a new acronym. Are you ready for this? I want you to hear this because we need to have our eyes open. They were using a new acronym. Listen to me. It's called BC and AC. Come on, you know what this is. BC and AC. Before coronavirus, after coronavirus. Our world has changed. We are entering a new season. We are on the march toward a new world order. Pastor David Jeremiah, you might know him. He is a celebrated author and scholar of end times biblical study. And he has also been one of President Trump's informal evangelical advisors. Now, I'm just telling you who he is. And so... Uh, this is who he is. He did uh, speak in a sermon recently if the coronavirus was biblical prophecy. Here's his response. He called the pandemic, here it is, quote, the most apocalyptic thing that has ever happened to us in our generation. There's no question about it. Church, are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord. I'm going to close in just a minute. I hope you're receiving this word today. Listen, one of the questions before I close in prayer is this. Listen, I want you to know, uh, Bride of Christ, Church of the Living God, will you go through the tribulation? Listen to me. If you trust in Jesus for your salvation, 
you will not be present during the tribulation. How do I know? The tribulation is not meant for the church. Can I say it again? Come on. The tribulation is not meant for the church. Jesus is coming for his bride. Are you ready? Are you walking with God? Is your faith awake, alive, alert? Are you paying attention to the signs of the times? Why? Jesus is coming for his church. And how do I know this? I don't have to look very far. I look to the word of God because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, here's the word of the Lord for you today. Listen to it again. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, that's in the New King James. Let me read the same verse in the Living Bible. Come on. For God has not chosen to pour out his anger upon us, but to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give it to you one more time. In the New American Standard Bible, you have to hear it. It says, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, are you still with me? I'm almost done the, this side of the road trip. Listen, let me ask you this question. What will Christians, are you ready for the question? What will Christians be doing during the tribulation? You've been caught up together with the Lord in the air. And for the time of tribulation, we are with the Lord in heaven with the Lord. And so, what will we be doing? What will Christians be doing during the tribulation? Two things. Are you ready? And I'm going to close in prayer in just a moment. Two things. Listen, Christ will judge the church for their faithfulness and reward the believers for how they faithfully serve the Lord. Okay? The second thing, there will be a celebration, a marriage reception where the bride, the church, is united with the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Well, you don't want to miss the handing out of rewards and the wedding celebration. I hope you're ready for the coming of the Lord. And so the scriptures say, and I leave you with these scriptures, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment, Listen to the word of the Lord to, to, today, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. Are you hearing? Come on, are you hearing the word of the Lord? Says this, Paul says to the church in Corinth, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We need to be ready, church. We need to be ready. Hebrews 12, are you ready? Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Are you running with endurance? Church, are you running with endurance? Or are you looking back to the past? Are you uh, weighed down with sin that so easily ensnares us? Or are you running? Church, I want you to get ready, get ready, get ready. How do we do that? We run the race with endurance. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I remember the last uh, run that I had the opportunity to, to participate in. It was the Toronto Waterfront Half Marathon. Now, do you, uh, it was a long run, 23 kilometers, and I ran my whole heart. I, I ran as hard as I could. I wanted to end well, end strong. I had one goal. Don't be last. That's my goal. But I had one goal. Keep your eye on the finish line. Keep running. Keep running. Keep running. Don't stop. Keep going. Why? I want to run with endurance. Listen to me. When I crossed the finish line, 
I'll still remember, I still remember what happened. I'll never forget it. What a moment. Uh, with people all around shouting, cheering, and celebrating. When I crossed the finish line, what did they do? They put a cape around me. I still have it here. They put this around me. Are you ready? I'm putting it on. They put a cape around me, and I crossed the finish line with my cape on. Then they gave me a Gatorade, of course, because uh, uh, this was to refresh my thirst. And then the moment that every runner looks forward to is when the official, uh, you walk up to the official and they take the medal, the medal that you have worked so hard for. You put your head down and they put it over your head and onto your neck and you wear the medal and you walk proudly through the crowd as a runner who has finished the race. Church, have you fin are you running the race? Are you running the race? Uh, I want you to be ready for the coming of the Lord. And so I want you to run with endurance. Come on, church. Run with endurance the race that is set before you. You are running with endurance. Why? Because Jesus' coming is soon. Jesus' coming is near. Don't give up. Don't let the weight of the world hold you down. Rid yourself of the sin that so easily ensnares and keep running. 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Obtain the prize. Church, run in such a way that you will obtain the prize. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Matthew 25, 21. When Jesus returns, he will say to his faithful servants, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God today. Lord, as we take this journey through the end times, as we uh, had our stop number two at the tribulation and stop number three at the rise of the Antichrist, Lord, our eyes are open, our hearts are open, we're ready to receive, we're ready to learn so that we can be awake and aware we can have understanding. And I pray, Lord, that you'd encourage the people of God today. Lord, help us to be ready for your coming. Help us to run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us. Lord, we're not going back. We're not looking back. We're not giving up. We're not giving out. Church, I say it again. Keep running, keep running, keep running with your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. He's coming for his bride. Will you be part of the bride of Christ, the church of the living God? Today, all you have to do is repent for your sins, believe in Jesus, believe that he died on the cross for your sins, and he rose again, and Jesus is coming for you. Walk with God, live for him, run the race, serve the Lord, keep your eye on the finish line. In Jesus' name, amen.